I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to my wood shop, aka the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to build my wife and I a tufted headboard. And this video is going to be broken down into two parts. In the first part, I'll demonstrate the woodworking portion of this build. And the second part will be all about the upholstery. And the motivation for tackling this project right now is spurred on by some really good news. As of the making of this video, my wife is six months pregnant. So I wanted to build a headboard to help us along through the first few months of infancy and potential lack of sleep. My two main goals for this project were, one, I wanted the headboard to be comfortable to lean against, and two, I wanted individual reading lights that would only minimally disturb the other person. Oh yeah, and I also wanted it to be sturdy and well-built, as we're planning to keep this headboard for many years. After jointing and planing the lumber, it was time to switch from my 40-tooth all-around blade to my 24-tooth rip blade. And the blade on the right in this shot is my 24-tooth rip blade. It has what's called a triple-chip grind, or TCG. And the blade on the left is my 40-tooth all-around blade, and it has an alternate top bevel grind, or ATB. So when I was switching between blades, I realized both the blades were very dirty, and I thought it was time to give them a good cleaning. Through normal day-to-day -day use, saw blades can get what's known as pitch buildup, and this pitch can increase drag and therefore increase heat and reduce the life of your saw blade. So it is a good idea to clean blades once in a while. And I like to use simple green that's been diluted 50-50 with water, as well as a brass brush. And one of my favorite pro tips, something we all have laying around, is if you flip a bucket over, it makes for a perfect 10-inch diameter saw blade cleaning station. And as you can see here, quite a bit of gunk was stuck to this blade. And here are a couple before and after shots. So with a freshly cleaned saw blade installed, it was time to rip my parts to width. And I decided that the sides and top would be ripped to 4 inches, and the face pieces would be ripped to 8 inches wide. And the 8 inch width for the face pieces was sort of decided for me. It was based on the boards that I had. After ripping the parts to width, it's time to cut some bevels along the edges. And for best results, on a table saw, I like to use a power feeder. And this is a one quarter horsepower Delta power feeder. And I like it because it's just big enough to do some heavy work, but it's light enough to take on and off the table saw without killing yourself. And I always like to change out the dense stock rubber tires for a softer polyurethane tire. This tire is a 50 on the Duro scale and that softness helps it grip parts better. This unit has four speeds, but one of the downsides of the cheaper power feeders is you actually have to physically change the gears to change the speed. And currently it's set up for the slowest speed, which is where I'd normally leave it. When cutting bevels on the table saw like this, I like to do it in either two or three passes. The first pass is a setup pass, just to make sure that everything's running the way that it should. The second, I just cut off the bulk of the waste. And then the third one is the final pass that I bring right up to the edge. And this is a really neat way to cut nice, consistent bevels. But if you don't have a power feeder, you can still cut these on your table saw. Just set up feather boards to keep consistent downward pressure. Another way to do this would actually be on the router table with a 45 degree chamfer bit. I think that would give really good results as well. With the bevels beautifully cut, it's time for the glue up. And I always like to start by taping across the joint. I like to do this just to make sure that the pieces are exactly the way that I want them. Then I come back with longer pieces of tape and I leave little windows between each of them so that as I'm gluing the two pieces together, I can make sure that the joints come together tight. And after taping the joints together, I always like to come back and double check for square. A while back I made eight of these plywood clamping squares, and these are perfect for clamping up long bevel joints. If you don't have a reference like this, it does make getting a nice 90 degree joint challenging. The shot was completely accidental, I didn't tighten the camera down enough. Oh, 
After lunch, I came back and peeled off the tape. Over the years, I've done this process probably more than 100 times, and yet every time I peel off the tape, I'm always surprised at how good the results are. Next, it was time to cut the long miters, and I thought, what better way to do that than the old Festool track saw? And the splinter guard on my track is a little worn out, so what I like to do is set the depth to 6 or 7 millimeters so the blade is just kissing the surface, run a cut backwards, and then come back and do a full depth cut. This creates a nice splinter-free cut. quick look at my highly sophisticated plans so I know exactly how long to cut the top piece. I remove any leftovers with a pull saw and I store them in a tightly sealed Tupperware container. Next I check for square and I get it close with a block plane. And then I take a few passes with a low angle jack just to fine tune the joint. One of the lessons I've learned probably one too many times over the years is when you're using hand tools, it's really easy to start taking things out of square. So I like to take a few passes, check square, then pick up the hand plane and take a few more passes. With the miters fitting tightly, it's time to move on to some joinery. And I had a few countertop bolts left over from my last project, so I thought, what the heck, I'll use these. And I thought, in addition to the countertop bolts, I'd throw a few biscuits in there just for good measure. The smaller size is a size 20, the larger size is an S6, and it requires two plunges of the biscuit joiner. And I think if you read the destructions provided by Lamello, it says to space the two plunges 3 8 inch apart. I like to do a half inch, it just gives a little bit more wiggle room. So here was a mid-course design change, and I decided to add this little piece after putting all of the three parts together. I thought that I might be able to kind of see in there after I put the upholstery in. So I thought putting some blocking in there would ensure that wouldn't be a problem after everything was assembled and glued together. So I had to cut off the excess and go back and touch everything up again with the low angle jack plane. I always like to clean up the inside edges prior to glue up. One last little detail before glue up, I wanted to add on some clamping blocks. Anytime I'm gluing a miter together, I like to think of it as gluing half end grain and half edge grain. And we know that end grain likes to really absorb glue. So I apply a layer of glue, let it sit and absorb for a second, then I come back and I apply some more glue. And this ensures that the joint isn't starved. Even though I used the mighty biscuit, I thought this joint needed some reinforcing. So I cut out some L shapes out of some plywood and glued and nailed it in place. After the glue was nice and dry, I came back and cut the clamping blocks off, and any leftover was removed with a hand plane or sandpaper. A little bit of hand planing to reduce the overall amount of sanding that would need to be done. I also decided to add a round over to the inside edge just to soften the feel a little bit. I thought this might be an edge that could be potentially bumped. And that is the perfect amount of glue right there. And I'm just gluing some blocking in place. Eventually the mounts will attach to this. 
I normally don't sand past 180 when I'm using a film finish. In this case, I sanded to 400 because I'm using a finish known as Osmo and I'm applying it in a wipe on, wipe off manner. So a very thin layer of finish gets built up and I think it looks better when it's sanded to a higher grit. Here's a quick shot of the blocking. There's gonna be a strip across the bottom that is used to mount the headboard, and then two strips used to mount the tufted portion. Now that the woodworking is complete, it's time to move on to the upholstery. And I get started by playing around with the layout of the buttons until I come up with an arrangement that I like. Once everything is laid out carefully and I have double checked my measurements, I drill a one quarter inch hole at the center point of each button. Now that I've determined the layout and drilled the holes, I know how many buttons I need. So I get started by cutting a bunch of circles out of the fabric that we've selected. Nothing better than zoning out and rocking out while doing a repetitive task. So I decided to go with size 45 buttons, and those are inch and an eighth in diameter. And all the button kits that I could find that had enough buttons said perfect for lightweight fabrics, not designed for upholstery fabrics. So I decided to go ahead and buy this kit, which came with 50 buttons, which would give me a few to experiment with because I only needed 23. And after a little experimentation, I found that if I cut the fabric back a little bit more, that would help. And then if I used a one inch PVC pipe to help squish the two parts together, I could get the two pieces and the fabric to hold together very nicely. So here's a closer look at the kit that I use. There's 50 of each part. And you can see the blue thing sitting there was the original tool designed to press the two pieces together. And this one inch pipe really works much better. So after all the buttons were put together, it was time to glue this foam down to the plywood backer board. Just killing time waiting for the glue to dry. That was like my fourth attempt at that shot. Missed all of them. And I'll spare you from having to listen to any more of that. All right, who could name that awesome rendition of that tune? If you can, I will offer you a sturdy and well-constructed digital high five. So when edge gluing two pieces of foam like this, it's important that these be stuck together as good as possible. And because I'm too cheap to go buy a proper foam knife, I just like to use a nice fresh hacksaw blade. A 24 TPI blade works great for cutting foam. All right, the next step is to mark the locations of the buttons on the foam. And I do this by poking a long needle through the quarter inch holes that I drilled and then marking the location on the foam with a Sharpie. And then after that, I mark the outside edges of where I want the holes to be drilled. And this just helps me line up the hole saw a little better. And I'm using a good old fashioned inch and a half diameter hole saw without the center pilot bit in place. And this works perfect as a foam cutter. After the holes are cut, I do a couple of practice tufting runs and I do this just to see how tight the fabric needs to be and also how deep I like the buttons. Here's my second attempt and it looks pretty good. So in this shot, I'm trying to demonstrate that the tufting holes from center to center, you actually need to place the buttons on the fabric at a larger spacing because the fabric has to make the turn and kind of go down into the hole a little bit. So I spend quite a bit of time accurately laying out where each button goes. This is, of course, on the back side of the fabric, but this makes the tufting very easy. You just follow this pattern. Quick side note, it's always good to make a button depth gauge so that each of the buttons is set to a consistent depth. 
I switch to the lightweight spray adhesive and I add a layer of heavy batting. I always get the heaviest batting that I can get my hands on. I'll fast forward a little and things are progressing nicely. So overall, the process is pretty simple. It's a little easier said than done, but ultimately I thread string onto a button, then I use two needles to locate where that button will be on the fabric. I poke one needle from the backside on the mark that I made earlier, then I use the other needle to come through from the top. That then brings the string through the fabric, through the foam, through the hole that I drilled earlier, and now the button is on top of the fabric. I can then pull the button tight and staple it to the plywood. And here's a shot of how I attach the buttons. I kind of do a couple stagger staples. I use six total. And I do this after pulling the button as tight as I'd like it. One of the more challenging aspects of tufting is being able to fold the fabric right. And it's a little different with each fabric. Thicker fabric is a little more challenging. And I spend quite a bit of time making sure that each of the folds is consistent. They're all pointing the same way. And this, I think, makes for a really nice looking professional tufting job. I'll take a second here to talk about upholstery in general. I think if you're a woodworker or furniture maker, upholstery is a really good skill to have. It's not too hard to learn, it doesn't take that many tools, and the tools pack up pretty small, so everything can just be put in a box and set aside, yet it adds a real soft side to a piece of furniture, and a particular type of comfort that can't be achieved with wood or metal or other materials. I guess what I'm trying to say is if upholstery is something you've been intimidated by yet still interested in, give it a try. It's easier than you think, and if you get good at it, it can really change the way your furniture looks and feels. This really is fiddly work. I like to staple down a couple of buttons and then work on the folds for a few minutes, staple down a few more buttons, work on the folds again, and so on. So a word of advice, if you do want to tackle some upholstery projects, I suggest two things. Get a nice pair of upholstery shears, spend some money on those, and do not try and do this with a hand stapler. A pneumatic stapler is the way to go. I just use the Harbor Freight ones, 25 bucks. I've probably shot 10,000 staples through that thing. Seems to still work okay. And uh, for 25 bucks, boy, has it saved quite a bit of headache. So after the center portion is done, I turn my attention to the perimeter and I work real hard to get the folds to look good. And then also I try and make the tension at which I pull the fabric consistent all the way around. After the upholstery is done, it's time for final assembly and installation. Don't let the cute and peaceful looks deceive you. These guys have destroyed my pear and plum trees. And let's finish this video off with a couple of beauty shots. I really like these lights. They have a touch switch to turn them on and off, and if you press and hold, it will dim them. Overall, my wife and I are both really happy with the end result. It's nice and simple, but a few small details stand out and really give it a nice, elegant appearance. Please note the paint samples on the wall. My wife and I are getting ready to do a room remodel. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do yet, but if something interesting pops up, I'll make a video of it. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time.